Happy Monday, friends, and welcome back to the Mark Claire Show. And I know I got a kind of a, a mad scientist hair look going on today for those of you watching on the video, which you can find anywhere and everywhere. YouTube, Odyssey, BitChute, Rockfin. I think that's about it. Rumble. There you go. That That is about it. Uh, but I assure you, I'm wide awake. I'm feeling great. You know why? Bam, right here. I got a brand new bag of my Fox and Sons Den Blend Dark. Sponsor of this show, supporter of this show, friend of the show, Stephen Fox, started this company to help teach his sons about entrepreneurship and share in his love of coffee. And boy, the love really shines through with this coffee because you can tell by these beans, by the freshness, Stephen Fox is not just getting, sourcing any garbage for you guys, all right? He's getting the finest, freshest beans from all around the world, mostly, you know, South America and that sort of thing. But there's a, a tan, Tasmanian pea berry or is it Tanzanian? It's probably both because he's this guy's got it all. So I want you to head over Choose a couple sample bags. Try a couple different beans. See what your jam is. Head over to Fox and Sons, F O X N S O N S dot com, Fox and Sons dot com. Use discount code MCS. Think Mark Claire. Show MCS gets you 18% off your order. Fox and Sons dot com. Head there right now while you and I head over to this week's interview, my conversation with the enigmatic. Yeah, I'm going to say it. The enigmatic Thomas 777. Welcome back to the Mark Claire Show. My guest today is a philosopher, a political theorist, a revisionist historian, and author, and as he might refer to himself, an unrepentant Peckerwood. I'm very pleased to welcome Thomas 777. Thomas, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. Pleased to have you here, Thomas. And you know, I've, as I was telling you before the show, I've probably heard you know seventy to eighty hours, probably more than that, of podcasts you've done with our, our friend of the show, uh, Pete Quinones. And uh, there's a lot of places we can start on the subject I, I want to get into today, talking a little bit about the Nazis and their interest in the occult. But first, I want to get to know you a little bit better. And I know you've got a got a fairly interesting backstory, so uh, I'll let you take it from wherever you think it makes the most sense. But I just want to get to know your background a little bit more, and you know, eventually how you became interested in, in everything you're interested in in regards to politics and history and that sort of thing. Sure, I'm from the North Shore of Chicago. If anybody knows the lay of the land demographically and culturally, um, you'll notice that that's kind of an odd fit for somebody like me. But my folks were. Angelinos. Uh, my dad was uh, my dad was a uh, like quite literally a white trash Oki who ended up at Harvard, owing to you know um, kind of accident of fate and an extraordinarily um, high intellect um, when it came to uh, certain certain tasks the army wanted him to complete. You know, my mom was very much like an old stock wasp. Uh, so I found myself, you know, kind of in uh, the strange uh, and terrible uh, <laughs> environs of Chicago's North Shore, which is my home. I love it here, but um, it is strange. It's kind of the uh, it's kind of like Twin Peaks meets less than zero. Um, you know, I, I I went to school. I went. I, I grew up with the. I grew up in a town that was about one third Jewish. The remaining two thirds were uh, kind of like nouveau riche. Uh, you know, uh, lace curtain Irish and like the, and mob guys, frankly, <laughs> um, my dad was an economist who was very much, uh, tethered to the, the, the cold war apparatus, you know, even when he entered the private sector. Um, so things like the cold war and power politics were kind of always quite literally the subject of the dinner table discussion in my house. Okay. Uh, I was always like an introverted bookish kid who was not in particularly good health. Uh, you know, so my dad and I were always extraordinarily close and he, he kind of fed my appetite for, um, you know, intellectual, uh, nourishment, um, very aggressively. And, uh, you know, from there, uh, I, uh, I started asking questions about my own environment, you know, as I developed kind of a, a more complete conceptual picture of the world around me. Um, and uh, owing to the the demographic balance that I, I, I just, you know, described, among other things, as well as the epoch in which I came at age, you know, which was the very end of the Cold War. I started asking questions, you know, about the Second World War and about, you know, the the reality of race and 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 sectarian questions. Um, 
and things like this. Uh, I, uh, in those days, you know, really all you had at your disposal was zines, you know, uh, on the more kind of heady side, stuff like the Institute for Historical Review newsletter, on the more kind of, on the more kind of rough uh, and raw side, you know, stuff like Tom Metzger's war newsletter. Um, I started just kind of like taking in as much as I could about, um, you know, revisionist topics. When I went to college, uh, I went to Loyola University, um, which might seem strange to some people considering my confessional heritage. But in those days, they had an unapologetically right wing history department, despite the fact it was, you know, more than nominally a Jesuit institution. And uh, they had a genuine um, political theory curriculum. You know, most universities, you know, uh, they've got a political science track, which is just kind of nonsense. You know, it's uh, you sit around kind of dealing with uh, antiquated kind of like modeling concepts of international relations and bullshit like that. And, you know, this just kind of very, very simple minded stuff. Um. You know, and then I got a scholarship to law school, even though I particularly want, even though I didn't particularly want to practice law. Like in those days, it, it wasn't like today. Like you couldn't say, like, I'm going to be a writer and just like try and monetize my shit and see where it goes. It was like, you know, what am I going to do? Like if I, I'm not, it's like I had ideas for books I wanted to write, but it's like, what was I going to do? Like write, write away to like Random House, be like, oh, I want to write a book, you know, impeaching the credibility of the Holocaust. <laughs> You know, I mean, so it, uh, I figured if nothing else, you know, it's like, I'd have a backup plan and I'd be able to practice law like that. That got derailed for all kinds of reasons. Uh, I mean, during that whole time, you know, from about the Usenet days onward, I mean, I was writing online, like about revisionist topics and other things. Um, you know, I, before, without even realizing it, I kind of developed a brand, not kind of, I did, I developed a brand around myself. I always had the same username. I've only ever been Thomas 777. Um, you know, life intervened and uh I I really uh I really kind of uh I fell pretty far um out of the world, frankly. I mean, owing to you know, owing to owing owing, owing to uh, a pretty um a pretty serious uh addiction to heroin for about a decade and and other things, you know, um, I got my life back on track and, uh, you know, put my legal difficulties behind me. Do you, do you um, mind me asking a little bit more about that? I, I just, no, kinda, go ahead. yeah, it's kind of, kind of something I want to dig into a little bit. Cause I, I'm sure that whole experience, I and mean, if you're had a heroin addiction for 10 years, it must've shaped everything. So many things in, in your life. And I'm kind of curious how, how you first went down that path and, and then how you got out of it. I mean, briefly, I wasn't a guy who, like, did drugs. Like, I didn't even smoke pot. Like, I tried it, you know, and because, like, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, like, I tried cocaine, like, three times. But I did. I wasn't, like, into drugs. You know, like, I just, I, not even, like, morally. I just, like, thought they were kind of stupid. And, like, I wasn't, you know, I, I, um, you know, I was, I was a competitive athlete, you know, in my college years, too, and stuff. So, I mean, I just didn't. When I got, when I started, when I, when I got into like pain pills, like from a legitimate doctor at first, you know, cause I, I, um, I had a rare, um, uh, I suffered from a rare childhood bone disease called Lake Perthes disease. And as I entered adulthood, um, it, uh, I developed early rheumatoid arthritis. And as I got into my thirties, it got really severe. And, um, you know, so in those days too, in like the two thousands, um, this was before DEA was really paying it. They were kind of deliberately ignoring the fact that doctors were handing out very, very heavy compounds like candy. That doesn't excuse me for being irresponsible with these things. Cause I always, I was always an educated consumer as it were, like with respect to this kind of stuff. I knew that things like Delouded were heavily habit forming, but at the same time, like I said, like, my view of drugs, my experience with them is that they're just kind of fucking stupid. Like, I don't really get anything out of them. So, like, what am I worried about? Right. Well, right. I mean, lo and behold, like, one day, like, I decided, like, okay, I'm re I'm too reliant on Delouded. I want to stop taking it. And, you know, the next day I was so sick, like, I couldn't get out of bed. Like, let alone go to work. Okay. 
So from you, the withdrawal? So you, you, I sort of like just what's that? From the withdrawal, then? That's yeah. What, that, that's it's what unimaginable. Thinking. Like yeah. people think it's just like. It's not like I'm being melodramatic, but I it, it's, it's like indescribable if you have like a serious opiate addiction, like what it's like to go into withdrawal. Like it's it's not just like having the flu or like it's I can't even describe it, man. There's a reason why guys like they'll and I mean, there's a reason why guys like literally like murder people, to like make sure they don't get sick. Like it's that fucked mm-hmm. up. Like I thought people were lying when I was like before I developed a habit. You know, I, I they, they're not lying. OK, it's it's you can't even imagine it. Like people, I don't, I don't know anything about alcoholism. I, I, but I know that like alcohol withdrawal is like utterly horrible and can kill you. That I'm sure that's comparable. But otherwise, like there were times like when I was in like court ordered like outpatient treatment, where guys there'd be like kids who were there, you know, who like got caught like doing some molly or something. They're like, oh yeah, like when I quit partying, I know what it's like. It's like, bro, you do not, man. Like you do not fucking know what it's like. Like it's, you know. Or like people saying like, oh, I did like meth, and like it's like, bro, you know what I mean? Stop doing meth. You go to sleep for a couple of days. <laughs> you know, I mean, like it's like I'm not saying like these things aren't like habit forming, and some people have, don't have a problem with them, but it's not. You keep doing dope when you don't want to do it because the alternative is too fucking horrible. Okay, I mean, like I'm not. I don't worse think I'm the, worse than person. death. You could argue, I, I suppose. Yeah. So. And also, too, like, I had to go to work and stuff. Like, I couldn't just say, like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm going to quit life for the next six months so I can, like, get my shit straightened out. So, you know, I started doctor shopping, and that worked for a few months. But, then, but you know, I mean, that by that point, you know, like, the the pharmaceutical databases were all integrated. I mean, that that went, that that that, that got, that, that, that had a short uh, lifespan because, like, they figured out what I was doing. Mm-hmm. You know, and then, like, I got flagged, and I couldn't, I couldn't get a prescription for even codeine. You know, and in Chicago, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, there's been an opioid crisis in Chicago since the 1950s. Okay, like there's there's spots here that have been dope spots literally for 40 years, and everybody knows where they are. And um, you know, I uh, the one guy who uh, you know, who who I, who I knew, like who was kind of insinuated into street life because he I mean, he was from my same town like he wasn't like some fucking hood dude he like chose this shit but um i'm just like look man i'm in terrible shape i need help and i have to give me some pills he's like no i can't get no pills mm. he's like, i'm gonna take you to see somebody so uh he picks me up and we literally go to fucking k-town on the west side you know and uh he introduces me to this dude you know uh and uh the dude sees how ill i am he hands me like a little fucking He's got like a little foil here. They they package dope, and he's like in foil generally because it's shine white. There's no fucking tar. He has got like a little bit of fucking foil. He's like you know fucking snort that, you know. And like I start cutting out a big line. He's like no 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 no. He cuts out like a tiny little bump, you know. And he's like take that much. So like I take this tiny little bump, and like immediately, like I'm no longer sick. Like I feel fucking fine. Wow. You know, it's like oh thank God, man. It's like for like days I'd been I, I'd been like in hell. You know, that was like my introduction to heroin, you know, um, and I'm like, this stuff only costs 10 bucks for like a big fucking bag. I'm like, that that's incredible. I'm like, awesome. You know, it's not like awesome. I'm doing heroin, but it's like, OK, like now I can function again and I don't need to fuck mm-hmm. with the pharmacy. And, you know, I I can keep this shit under control. Well, you, you can't keep that kind of shit under control. And literally within a couple of weeks, you know, like my tolerance was such that I could like snort a whole bag of that shit. And like it would barely take my sick off, wow. you know. So uh, eventually, you start shooting up because snorting doesn't get your sick off anymore, mm-hmm. you know. And then you know, it just goes from there. And you know, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna kick, but it's like you know, again, like you, you're not in a position generally where you can, you know, where you can kind of like put the brakes on life for like a month or however long you need to like get yourself together. And even if you are, like it's. It's a it's a daunting prospect, man. To be like, I'm just gonna like sit it out and be sick. Like I've done it, you know what I mean? Like it's, um, I I could never stick it out on a permanent basis. And I mean, short story long. Uh, we'll move on from this. But I um, you know, uh, I got I caught a slew of arrests, uh, all, all for fucking narcotics. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, um. I got picked up with substantial weight. I had about 50 bags on me. Um, you know, uh, 
and I, I caught felony charges. The judge had mercy on me because I, mean, I, I was just honest. I'm like, I got, I got a fucking serious habit. You know, I'm like, I'm not, you know, I'm like, look, I'm like, you give me, I'm like, you give me 5,000 bags of dope. I'm not giving them to anybody. I'm keeping them. You know, the judge realized, and plus, like in Chicago, it's like Irvine Welsh shit. He said it was the most, he said it was the most divided city by like ethnos he'd ever seen other than Belfast. Like they knew, like nobody in Chicago, even if like, like basically, like even if, if you're a white dude, if you, like 50 bags isn't to, like to a, to a civilian, that seems like a lot. It's not actually, but even if I was caught with like a lot of dope. In Chicago, they'd be like, okay, this white dude's not, he, he's, he's doing something, but he's not, you know, he's not like swinging dope or whatever. Right. Like in the he's got problems, but he's not, yeah, yeah, he's not yeah. the problem so, in the community. Yeah. And that's the reality of it. And plus too, I'd like to think, uh, you know, they looked at my background and cause I, you know, and, and the judge is like, what's like, what's going on with you? He's like, first of all, he's like, you're a dude in his thirties. He's like, apparently you got a law degree. You know, he's like, you don't have any felony background. I'm just like, look, I'm like, I, you know, I'm like, I made some really bad decisions in my life, like relating to my own health and things. And I, I've got like this fucking habit, you know? Um, and I mean, that was that. And I, because I was on felony probation for almost five years, if I didn't stop fucking with dope, I would have gone to prison. Okay. You know, I got on a methadone treatment program. I got, I got to see like a regular doctor too, like from arthritis and things, you know, mm -hmm. that, and that helped, you know, and, uh, the methadone doesn't get you high. So mm -hmm. it, you know, is an actual analgesic and it's, you know, it, it helped me, it helped me get off illicit drugs as well as like shoring up my rheumatoid symptoms and making them manageable. And I mean then, but then it's also just like other, you know, it's it just like something clicked, man. Like I, I, my whole like mindset changed now, not, not, not cause of anything, not, not cause I had like some like punctuated experience or something of, uh, or like some like epiphany. It, it wasn't like that, but it, it's just that everything changed like within a pretty rapid, within, within a pretty short, uh, window, man. And like, you know, then, and, and then like when I got off probation and stuff, I just like started writing again online. And then I realized that like there was all these people who I guess over the years had been like reading my stuff and like that kind of blew my mind, you know, and then a bunch of people started reaching out to me, like including like our different Pete Canones, mm -hmm. you know, and they, they wanted me to like contribute to their content. And at first I was like shy about it because I was always kind of self-conscious. Like people might think that's weird because like I take a lot of selfies and I do kind of like goofy <laughs> stuff, you know, but I <laughs> like it's, you know, but I, but in terms of actually putting myself out there, like, this is my work product. Like, this is what I think. Mm -hmm. I was kind of like self-conscious about that. Cause I, I, I just was, but then I got over that pretty quickly because, um, people were pretty supportive, man. Um, that, that sounds corny. I mean, in, like a genuine way, like there was like people I respected, like, were like, Oh wow, this is valuable. Like what you're doing. I think that that's, you know, I, I think you were, you're onto something with X, Y, Z, you know? Um, and that uh, were you writing actively then while during the heroin addiction? Yeah, not in a way. I I mean, yeah, because I because I, I, I write compulsively. Like I don't know what mm -hmm. to do otherwise. Like that's right. That's it's been the way it's, that it's just there. Like, it has not, to come out. Yeah, and it wasn't like uh, I mean, it was there was different kind of stuff in so, most of the time. But yeah, I I um, some of it I saved. A lot of it I got rid of because I don't like to think about it. But yeah, and uh, I mean, some of that I've I've. I've published online to out of the fact, but, um, but you know, and then it's like my, my life kind of, my life just like dramatically changed in 2020. Like I'd long like left like dope behind and shit by that point. But that was only like a year and a half after I'd gotten off probation, you know? And like, I, like I said, like that's right when I came back to writing and, and then and like everything changed, man. I've just, I, mm. I, I, you know, I, I, um, I monetized this content brand and started kind of doing this full time. But, uh, you know, people started inviting me places. So I just kind of like started like periodically, like going all over the country. You know, that's what I was doing this past summer too. And, you know, it, it just seems like that's the path that God wants for me. Um, I know some people think that sounds corny, but, um, I, that that's, that's the only way I think it can be, um, characterized, you know, so that's, you know, fast forward like three years from 2020 and like, here we are now. So that's, uh, kind of my deal. Um, you know, I write, 
I write science fiction. I like to think of the science fiction. I like my, my primary kind of inspiration in that regard are guys like John Stakely and, you know, who are in armor and, um, Frank Herbert and Shane Stevens. You know, I, I think science fiction is a good medium to present philosophical ideas in novel form. You know, I'm working on a book, uh, on, uh, international jurisprudence since 1945 and, you know, the implications for that and, and how, you know, it, it represents a revolutionary paradigm, um, within which, uh, you know, the political rights has quite literally been criminalized. Um, you know, I, I've got this podcast. Um, I, uh, I, I just, uh, I've got a YouTube channel. I was, I was on in Vernal, Utah, like filming content for it. Um, you know, and so that's, I'm kind of transitioning to, to more video content. Um, and I've beefed up and kind of sexed up the, the production value of my pod. So in season two of that launches, we're going to launch on Halloween season two with a mind phaser podcast. I'm pretty excited about it, man. Um, you know, and that's, that's funny. Kind of my, my, my po- this podcast was also, was launched on Halloween last year as well. That's awesome. Just felt like but, the right day to yeah, start. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't mean to ramble, but that's I'm no, very, that's very why you're here. I, I want I want yeah, to get okay. the full the full version of things for sure. Um, so cool. I don't know. That's a really interesting backstory, and it's 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 almost like getting out of that heroin addiction. It, like next thing you know, you're you know you're you're getting contacted by people, and I mean it's probably been a couple of years now that you've been doing these pod, these podcast series with Pete, and which I know has really uh, helped get a lot more attention to what you're doing. It's certainly how I found you as well. Um, so maybe we could, I don't know if there's a smooth transition, probably not. So we'll just dive right into, uh, the subject at hand here. And, um, a lot of stuff I look into on this show is more of the, uh, the occult, the esoteric type stuff. And with your background and your knowledge, uh, about the Nazis and everything, this seemed like the perfect, you seem like the perfect person to come on and tackle this subject. So, and I know you have, you definitely probably look at the entire, uh, that entire section of history, not probably definitely, uh, much differently than the mainstream view. So I'm not sure exactly what what kind of groundwork you think we should lay before we fully dive in but just maybe lay lay whatever groundwork you think would be necessary for people to understand that they might not get from their sunday school i don't know if you learn about nazis in sunday school but from their regular public school upbringing or mainstream narratives or what have you um that will allow us to really understand and dive into the the sort of nazi obsession with the occult well, there's a few things going on here I mean, first of all, there was and is a propaganda dimension to the way this is characterized. That's not the whole story, obviously, but casting the German Reich and the Germans themselves, um, particularly, uh, I mean, there's an obvious, uh, there's an obvious uh, prejudice held by you know, Zionists and their sympathizers, uh, you know, they're going to cast Europeans generally and, and Germans specifically in kind of the most, uh, villainous manner, I guess, villainous light imaginable, but also to kind of paint them as, you know, exotically evil. Mm. Um, but there's also some of these, uh, some of these, some of these Germanophobic, uh, Anglophone types, you know, particularly, uh, like some of these kinds of bizarre true believers around, around Churchill and what have you, they, 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 they really did try and characterize the Germans as being, you know, this kind of like not quite civilized, like literally pagan race. Mm. And which is incredibly bizarre when you consider that like the United Kingdom is, is like literally Germanic, you know, but I mean, it all that aside. Um, so there's that, however, um, the degree to which uh, there were and are uh, pre-rational, pre-Christian cultural strains, uh, symbols, like prime symbols, um, kind of like subtle and not so subtle conceptual reference points, you know, within European culture uh, of, a, of a legitimately pagan nature. I mean, that, that is true. Okay. And that's not unique to Germany. I really like uh, the the old movie with um, with Edward Woodward uh, and Christopher Lee, The Wicker Man. Mm, yeah, I mean that's yeah. a whole that's that's a that's a brilliant film. But I've it seen also, the I've seen the Nicolas Cage it's version. A, it's, but... it's literally about 
Okay, no, no, avoid that at all costs. But the <laughs> the Wicker Man uh, with Edward Woodward, it's it's quite literally about uh, you know, it's set on this uh, like Isle of Man on the Isle of Man, I think. It's quite literally about like the interfaith tension between paganism and Christianity in Europe. And when you're dealing with truly ancient societies, I mean, I, I don't want to get into like a deep anthropological discussion like about about race, but um, if you accept that the white race essentially has existed for 40,000 years, okay, in, in like rough terms, okay, I mean, you're talking about you're talking about tens of millennia of deep history um, that shaped uh, European peoples, okay. There's going to be things within that genetic uh, heritage um, and uh, and cultural inheritance that um, are truly primordial. Okay. Now, nowhere is this more kind of evident uh, than in uh, Central Europe, where um, you know not only. Uh, not only is Europe an indefensible peninsula, you know, which is why the Germans evolved uh, into kind of the 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 perfect martial race, but uh, you know, um, the, uh, the 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 quite literal collision of tribes, ethnicities, peoples, you know, uh, gave rise to uh, contemplation of you know what it means to be civilized and what it means to be the other. And, you know, some of the later crusades were quite literally against, uh, against, uh, Baltic pagans and the like. Okay. The people who practice things like ritual human sacrifice, you know, okay. Like well into the era when we, when we think of, you know, Europeans as being, you know, I mean, life was obviously difficult in the middle ages, but you know, but when we think of Europeans as being well beyond that kind of thing, okay? Um, so that obviously informed perspectives. And finally, um, you know, in the 20th century, uh, I've discussed this a lot in uh, the context of historicism and, you know, conveying the kind of concrete particulars of the 20th century conceptual horizon and the ideologies that it gave rise to and specifically the kind of um the, the kind of universal belief in in, in kind of like rationalist materialism you know and uh material processes as 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 um you know as a uh, is, 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 is the ultimate cause of, of, of not just history, but of man's affairs and, you know, the source of, uh, of all, uh, of, of all higher life. Okay. Um, it was just accepted by people that, okay, you know, God is dead, you know, religion has been refuted by, mm -hmm. you know, the advent of modern science, you know, uh, we're moving towards an epoch where the planned society is going to eliminate uncertainties. You know, like it, literally everybody believed this. Like now that's laughable. That's why like the new atheism that uh, these kinds of pitiable types like uh, like uh, Dawkins and Hitchens like tried to kind of necromance after the Cold War. Like that. that's why that's, people view viewed as like cringe and fucking retarded. Okay, because like <laughs> nobody, nobody thinks that way anymore. You know, but in the 20th century, everybody thought that way. You know, and that's that's why Marxist Leninism, you know, captured the zeitgeist in the way that it did. But kind of as a response to that, um, people delved into these kinds of alternative, like spiritual spiritual practices, like some of which were very contrived, you know, some of which were very much premised on like folk tradition, but no one really had a context. You know, like in the Great Gatsby. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald parodies that because like Daisy Buchanan and her kind of flaky friends, they go to like seances and stuff. Yeah. Like yeah. people actually did that shit. Like Eleanor Roosevelt like was into that kind of shit. You know, and you had um like you had guys who were like society type people, like consulting astrologers. Mm -hmm. 
So when people uh, maybe that's out, part like, of what you turn maybe that's kind of part like of what you're um, documentary and they're like, yeah, like, I was gonna say that's kind of like what you're talking about is interesting, like because I I have this conception too of the, the specifically the Nazis being so involved in the occult and Hip, Hitler looking into these things because I've probably seen a million you know, um, History Channel documentaries and what have you. But that kind of goes to what you were saying earlier about sort of trying to, you know, villainize even more and make things look weirder and stranger on that end of things because you could do the same exact probably story or a similar story about uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, FDR, any kind of weird stuff well, yeah. they're into as well. So it really well, it's is... It's also, a, well, that was what I was going to say, you know, like, so when you watch some, like, BBC documentary or something about, like, Rudolf Hess's flight and then, and, and there's, like, this... There's, there'll be like some stern like British guy being like, and Rudolf Hess believed in astrology, you know, like the maniacal <laughs> right. Nazis. Right. It's like, man, like there's there like astrologers like on every corner, like in, <laughs> in, in like poor districts in London, you know, in some right. neighborhoods, man. Like it's like the, you know, like people just like believed in this stuff. And we'll get into this in a moment, but the man Hitler himself, like, like Hitler, it, it had no interest in this kind of thing. Hmm. He actually, he, he banned astrology after Hess's flight. Um, like the practice of it, I mean, you know, like for profit, because he thought that this was like misleading people into foolish, you know, kind of distractions in the midst of a national emergency and like insinuating, you know, just kind of like, like, uh, you know, like primitive and, and asinine ideas into kind of the national consciousness, you know, like there, like, like Hitler had no occult beliefs at all, like none. Um, the Reichsfeer SS Himmler did, and we'll get into that in a minute, but you know, there's like, there's literally, there's some stupid old movie with, uh, I mean, it's ass and I, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's ass and I, it's hilarious. It's, uh, like Alec Guinness, like plays, uh, plays Hitler in it, which uh, is, is kind of like a comically gross miscast. But the, um, the, uh, it's, I believe it's that, there's, there's that one and there's a movie called The Plot to Kill Hitler with Brad Davis from the 80s. And both of the Hitler's like looking at a star chart. But in any event, there's these, there's these there's these almost caricaturish renditions of Hitler himself, like reading star charts and you know seeking out like mystics, like that was completely at odds with reality. And um, Hitler was a deist in some basic sense, um, and he spoke uh, of the Catholic Church um, as being important culturally. And he talked about you know Germany had a very uh, Germany had a very brutally sectarian heritage, okay? Um, and uh, Hitler was, uh, that, that, that understanding that is key to understanding Hitler's ascendancy because Hitler was a Habsburg Austrian Catholic um, who presided over a coalition of, uh, you know, Prussian, uh, like, like pietist Lutheran Prussian officers um, and uh you know uh like like Bavarian Catholic industrialists and um you know a uh and a, and and um and, and brought them together um under a like within like a common coalition which is really quite remarkable and I made the point of people again and again too like in Hitler's December eleventh speech to the Reichstag, which in some ways is Hitler's most significant um wartime speech. Uh, one of the key takeaways, he's talking about the situation on the Eastern Front, and he's saying, like, we've been here before in 1813. When he says we, the Prussians were the only German state that joined Napoleon's assault on Russia. So Hitler's identifying literally the German people with Prussia. And he's, a, he's a, and again, he's like a Habsburg Catholic doing this. Um, that's, and the fact that he could do so credibly, like represent, you know, the German people as like a united people, like amidst, uh, these kinds of competing confessional and, and, um, and cultural practices is really remarkable, but be it as it may, yeah. And we'll dive into the meat of what exactly the third Reich's relationship to occultism was in a moment, but you know, the idea, like, Hitler himself had no interest in these things at all. But I will qualify that by saying that there is an uh, a general tendency towards mysticism in the German culture. You know, Meister Eckhart is, uh, should be the most kind of familiar uh, personage 
in that regard. Um, but also like Lutheranism, you know, Lutherans are definitely Protestants. I mean, they're like they're like the original Protestants. But you know, we talk about we talk about Bible Protestants, you know, uh, like Reformed dissenters, as a uh, as distinguished from Lutherans because Lutherans really do have their own lore. They really do have their own like theology extrinsic to the Bible. That is something that's very, very uniquely German, you know, and that's, and that's, that's, that's precedent in, in all kinds of ways. So with that said, like what exactly was, what exactly was the third Reich's relationship to occultism? Well, as we've said, you know, in the in the inner war years, there was a basic interest in this kind of stuff, okay? Um, and there were uh, Heinrich Himmler, uh, in particular, took an interest in this. Himmler was something of a lapsed Catholic. Like people made a lot of the fact that a lot of uh, the Stuttgartians, um, a lot of their kind of like rites and rituals, like borrowed in their view from the Catholic church. That's not really wrong. Okay. But, um, frankly to continental Europeans, that's, what's going to be familiar. Okay. Like speak like back to Hitler himself, you know, Hitler grew up, uh, Hitler grew up in a town that was literally like an ecclesiastical town. Like it was known for, it, it was, it was known for its churches. You know, it was known for, you know, kind of like Catholic, religious life being kind of like the center of, of, of sociality. Uh, there was this like kind of like rich Baroque, like, uh, uh, architecture everywhere. Like everything about like the Habsburg empire kind of like exuded that. So, I mean, even like any man born in like the late 19th or very early 20th century, you know, from Bavaria, like Himmler was, or especially or Hitler, especially he was born, you know, like, uh, um, in a place, you know, in, in on, on the Austrian frontier bordering Bavaria, like when he thought about like high optics and he thought about cultivated aesthetics, he'd be thinking about like Baroque Catholicism. Okay. But beyond that, um, Himmler wasn't a, wasn't a crank in the way that he's portrayed. Uh, I mean, if he, you, whatever you can say about Hitler, you can't say that he didn't have a great, understanding and instinct for uh, understanding of an instinct for delegation and uh himmler would not have become he, he would not have become like you know the, the the party and then the state's like security chief before he was 40 years old if he was some, if he if he was if he was somebody who could not you know be trusted to, to fall back upon reason as his as his primary you know modality of of, of, of problem solving um Himmler, however, did believe that, you know, very fervently, um, in spite of or perhaps because, because of the epoch in which he lived, there had to be a strong spiritual foundation uh, to the racial state, okay? But it had to be something authentic. It, it, you could, couldn't just be some cobbled together thing, okay? Not just because people would see through that and because it would be susceptible to attack, um, you know, from dissidents within but uh you know he believed very much uh in the possibility of, a, of like a of a literal like racial memory and honestly so did carl jung and even today as you know epigenetic memory um it's becoming clear that this is a real thing i mean it's not some far-fetched thing okay um even though the even though the um the, the methods and the tools to, you know, properly um, investigate such things weren't extant um, in that era. Like it, uh, it, it instinctively, I mean, it, it's it, like anybody who fancies himself a student of race and, uh, you know, of, of kind of the mystery of, of, of human culture, of the origin of language, of, of, of you know, the, the literal like origins of basic social order. You know, he's going to contemplate, you know, the degree to which, you know, m like literal memory, these memory of these things is heritable. You know, so Himmler, he had there's pragmatic as well as, you know, kind of eccentric or, or purely like, you know, intellectual and esoteric reasons for him to seek out these things. And. 
a man who kind of insinuated himself into uh into Himmler's uh good graces uh was uh was a guy named Karl Maria Vilgut. Uh, some people refer to him as kind of like the 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 National Socialist Rasputin. Uh, I think that's misguided mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons, but um who was Vilgut? He was born in 1866 in Vienna um, from a long line of, uh, of army officers. Vilgut followed that tradition. Um, he uh, was commissioned in the infantry, uh, served with, you know, massive distinction, um, you know, for the Habsburg Empire. Was a World War I hero, um, you know, enjoyed a succession of commands. You know, upon retirement, he had a chest full of medals. And uh, he developed this really, quite literally, an obsession in retirement um, for mythological subjects, you know, particularly related to race, particularly related, you know, the German people. Um, he uh, started claiming that he had, he started claiming to possess ancestral clairvoyant memory which literally enabled him to recall, you know, like the lives and experiences of his forebears thousands of years ago. Um, he was literally having visions. Okay. Was he kind of like a, a German Edgar Casey type sort of somewhat, but it was weirder because like, again, he was a pretty straight laced, uh, you know, Habsburg, uh, army officer. And, um, who, who again, like he, in, in in older age, he seemed to just kind of rapidly develop this sensibility, which, hmm. frankly, if one believes in such things, it, it probably lent it credence because it's like, okay, here's this kind of straight laced guy. Now he claims he's having visions right. and he's, uh, and uh, the visions he described were incredibly elaborate. Um, he, uh, um, he described uh, learning, uh, you know, how to read the runes, you know, from these visions he was having, the system that he worked out and wrote out and showed to people. <clears throat> it was basically, it, it was basically convergent with the one, uh, uh, the one uh, that was being promoted by Guido von Liszt, who was another kind of like Volkish mystic, you know, and whether you, whether you accept the legitimacy of that kind of thing or not, it was it was very strange the kind of convergence of of things like this. Okay, that um, it, it did not seem that he was faking it, whatever was wrong with him or whatever he was you know experiencing. Um, he uh, there was a uh, another man named Theodore Chep Chepel who uh, he was involved in a, this group called the Order of the New Templars, which uh, was kind of adjacent to the Tool Society, as I think a lot of people, uh, the Tool Society, people make a lot of the fact that, uh, you know, they, 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 they utilize the swastika um, as their uh, prime symbol. Um, and Hitler uh, subscribed uh to their uh, newspaper called Ostara. So his reason, like, oh, Hitler was this, you know, pagan mystic, or, you know, that's why he adopted the swastika. The swastika had all kinds of evocative power, um, just in terms of, like an everyday symbol, you know, particularly to Europeans. Um, and frankly, it just like looks cool and it's memorable. So I think people read too much into that. I mean, I, I know they do, but it's. Uh, so are you saying that there wasn't really a deep esoteric uh, meaning behind choosing the swastika? Was it more akin to just this fucking looks cool and people kind of like jive it with was it? Both, right? But it's like in terms of, no, I mean, I, it, it definitely, you know, it, re it represents uh, the solar cult, you know, it, 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 it's, uh, it's a, um, it was, it was a symbol of primordial Indo-European origins, like all those things. But to, in deciding what to put on your flag, mm -hmm. you know, Contra, especially the hammer and sickle, taking like a white disc on a blood red background and like mm. a black swastika at an angle, like that's incredibly that grabs you and it just like looks cool. You know, what I mean, like the hammer and sickle also looks cool. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, again, too, like my point was that there's guys who were like entirely 
you know, had no interest at all in like in wokish stuff or, you know, occult belief structures uh, or systems, you know, who, who, who like, who like uh, fought and rode under the swastika, you know, uh, I mean, just because like, it's, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a symbol that they felt uh, compelled to attach themselves to uh, for, for various reasons of an aesthetical and historical nature. But um, my point was that the, uh, the esoteric occult meaning of it, um, is overstated and the decision to adopt it as the party standard. Gotcha. Um, it, uh, <clears throat> as Villa got, uh, got kind of, um, he, as he associated more and more with these, with these order, of the new Templar types and Chapel, um, he, uh, he, uh, he, he told them, you know, he basically gave them his, uh, his narrative that he'd been developing or that he'd been, you know, availed to through his, uh, visionary experiences that he was, he was the bearer of a secret line of, of like the original German race. And we'll get into what he meant by that in a moment. Um, you know, and that, uh, and, and that not only, you know, was not only was he, a a bearer of that bloodline, um, in general terms, but, uh, he was one of the last, bearers of the noble line of you know the kind of root race um he uh he said that he had he said that his visions told him that in an imperial palace at goslar um lay a crown that you know that 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 if recovered could like prove his claims um and that like a sword belonging to his lineage could be found in a stone grave at uh steinmonger i mean like really like very crazy, very crazy seeming stuff. But again, like elaborate and specific enough to the point that, you know, especially considering the declarant again, Villagut was, you know, the guy was a war hero who, you know, wore the uniform in a command capacity for 40 years. You know, it gave people pause when he began saying these kinds of things. And again, too, like this was not, this is not some guy, you know, running around in in like dirty rags, you know, just kind of like saying in, in confused generalities, like God's talking to him. He described these elaborate religious practices, military organizations, constitutional arrangements, societal practices, you know, like visionary kind of like vistas and things like that he was supposedly receiving through these visions, you know, and uh, it it really drew people in. You know, um, it gets really strange with the crux of what, uh, like, Vilgut's kind of whole, like, encompassing ideology was. If we can, or like, the, yeah, like, like, kind of like religious ideology. Basically, what he stated was that, look, he's like, essentially, all the religious texts you're familiar with, including the Bible. You know, he's like, these things came originally from, you know, kind of like the Indo-Aryan uh, homeland. Okay. Um, like, like hundreds of thousands of years ago. Okay. He said the original, the he said the original Aryan religion was Erminist, uh, which was distinct and, 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 uh, and opposing uh, Odinism. And we'll get into that. What I mean by, or what he meant by that in a moment. Um, and he said the Christian religion later, part of this, they bastardized it deliberately, but part of it was they just misunderstood it because this was lost to history for reasons we'll get into in a minute. Um, essentially he said that, um, originally, uh, the universe was created by a single Supreme being, you know, there was one God and the ancient Teutons, you know, the people who were like the, the progenitors of this Erminus religion like uh they 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 had a pantheistic view but but it was but it was but they believed in like a united god their conception of the cosmos was totally opposed to the polytheism of odinism okay he claimed this stretched back to the late neolithic like when the aryans first like arrived in central europe you know he said uh the ancient tudons they prayed only only to the single God and to their ancestors. And uh, the Christians later took this for the idolatry of the sort that they 
encountered among the Greeks and the Romans, you know, who had a, who had a tradition of hard polytheism, for lack of a better way to characterize it. Okay. And uh, he said subsequently that a conflict emerged between like Odinus or Votanus and, you know, like the true bearers of the Aryan religion, um, owing to the corruption of foreign influences, which had altered like the Teutonic conception of, you know, the root race religion of Urbanism or whatever. Um, you know, and they and 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 the concept of God was 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 literally fractured and thus corrupted. And presumably what he was talking about was that a kind of poly the polytheism we discussed that was within this paradigm practiced, you know, among the Greeks and the Romans, uh like Celts and other Aryans who'd been set who'd 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 who'd, you know, and 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 especially peoples who'd you know, encountered uh, the Roman, the Greco-Roman ways in the Middle East, you know, as they returned to Europe, uh, what Vilgut referred to as the Sea Peoples, the Late Bronze Age. Like, these are the people who carried with them, like, this kind of, like, bastardized Odinism, okay? And Vilgut claims that uh, who they brought with them was, as, as their kind of, like, occulted leaders were, like, this corrupt priesthood, it ultimately became the Catholic Church. Okay. Mm. So these like disguised Odinists and the Catholic Church in Europe, they set about like wiping out, you know, like the um, you know, the uh the, the Urbanist or whatever, you know, like original like root race, like priestly warrior caste, of whom, of course, like Vilgut declared himself to be like, you know, one of the one of the last remaining uh representatives of, you know, in terms of his bloodline. Um, and, uh, you know, so basically he was saying that like everything, everything, you th- everything you think about European origins, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, about like Hallstatt, like archeological cultures, you know, and these influences from Greece and like Thrace, you know, which is modern Bulgaria, you know, he's like all this stuff. He's like, you're, you're misreading, you know, the reality of, of, of what, of, of like the Aryan, you know, uh, uh, of, of, of like of like you know the Aryan heritage okay um and he said that cr- the chronology also began around a quarter million years ago okay when there was like multiple suns in the sky the earth is populated by like proto-humans by monsters by like beings that we consider to be mythical but that you know you find reference to in like arcane texts because these things actually existed now this seems totally insane but there's just enough there, particularly at a time when, you know, archaeological digs were uncovering, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, like from ancient animal fossils of like monstrous beasts to like very, very strange, uh, you know, and, and, and remarkably intact, you know, kind of like funerary structures of like ancient societies. You know, this kind of there's like fertile ground for this kind of stuff. And again, <laughs> Like crazy as it seemed, uh, Vilgut wasn't just again. He wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't just like some. He wasn't just like some a hobo. Or he, he wasn't even like some like a kind of like, kind of like court crank like Diogenes. This guy was like a war hero of noble pedigree. You know who had like a lot of clout. And um, you know it's it uh, at worst. You know it inspired like a a, a kind of grudging tolerance. And at best. You know, like an actual reverence as some kind of, you know, as some kind of a uh, like racial prophet, um, who uh, you know might be speaking in riddles, but who carried with him some like fundamental truth about, you know, uh, about um, about the blood, like literally, of European peoples. Mm-hmm. And uh, Himmler had taken it upon himself to uh, to. Uh, develop a uh like it like 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 an an, an anthropological and archaeological capability within the Schutzstaffel itself um not for reasons like steven spielberg would have you believe because like he thought the spear of destiny he was gonna like shoot lasers out and destroy the enemies of the reich or something like that but it uh there had to um the Third Reich was not like the Soviet Union. It was not like this top-down revolution where everything was wiped away and a party-state apparatus just conquered everything. You know, uh, the Third the, the the Third Reich was constituted by a National Socialist Party um, 
that was a plurality uh, um, faction in a in a governing coalition. As time went on, its power mandate dramatically increased and cannibalized a lot of previously independent or even opposing uh, cabinet offices and administrative uh, power bases. But uh, that owed largely to the exigencies of war and the, the massive support for Hitler himself that it did, uh, you know, some kind of grand mandate of the party. You know, so it uh, the party always found itself competing with the apparatus of state and pre-existing structures, like some of which were very harmoniously assimilated into the kind of the authority structure, uh, some of which uh, there was out and out hostility between um, the party and the state. And Himmler... Uh, and was was more aware of this than anybody because uh you know he'd been saddled with the unenviable task of bringing all the police agencies within the Reich uh under the authority of of the Schutzstaffel, which as one could imagine was not particularly popular um among uh you know the several uh states of uh and principalities that constituted Germany. But uh, what he also realized is that within the Third Reich and owing to, you know, not just these kinds of the peculiar kind of agonistic pluralism of the, of the uh, you know, of, of the of the state itself and the kind of, you know, dynamic tension bet- between the party apparatus and, and the state. He also realized that, uh, you know, there had to be the, the party had to, had to have its own capability to kind of, you know, contribute to, if not outright dominate, you know, like intellectual narratives, you know, and that meant that the SS had to do things other than just, you know, field like crack military forces in the form of the Waffen SS and, you know, represent, you know, kind of the sword and shield of the party in the form of the Algemein SS and the police and the SD. Okay. So, you know, and finally too, you know, if the SS was supposed to constitute, you know, a night, literally a knightly order, you know, and uh, a new a new vanguard of literally a racial vanguard of Europe. OK. Um, and for men to be initiated into this brotherhood, uh, this, you know, nightly fraternity, you know, you had to educate them uh, on, uh, on, on on racial matters. And first and foremost, that meant, you know, cultivating understanding of of deep racial anthropology. OK. Um, so. Himmler set about uh, to develop uh, a capability within the structure of the SS itself. And uh, he made uh, he made the acquaintance, upon making the acquaintance of uh, of, uh, of Vilga, uh, he uh, he gave him, you know, he bestowed upon him the, the rank of uh, Hauptsturmführer which uh, was approximately commensurate with his retirement rank of colonel. Ultimately, he'd enjoy the rank of brigade Fuhrer, which was the equivalent of general in the SS upon the personal recommendation of Himmler. But uh, he consulted Vilga on a wide range of issues. And it uh, from the, the famous Totenkopf honor ring that uh, you know SS men all received, uh, Vilga had designed that. Uh, the conception of Wevelsburg uh, and the order castles in generally, um, Vilga, uh, the, the, these these uh, ideas largely came from Vilga. Uh, the kind of ceremonial aura um, and optics of the SS, this all came from Vilga. Um, over time, uh, he lost favor with Himmler. He was kind of quietly retired. I mean, he was quite elderly by the end of his, uh, you know, kind of formal association with, uh, the shoe stuff anyway, but, uh, it's, um, you know, it's, 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 I mean, you look at one of two ways, like did I mean, people like to portray it as, you know, like, Oh, well, you know, Vilga became even too much of a mad fool, even for Himmler. That's, I think, I, I, 
Hitler tended to like use people. Uh, I, I've got a more charitable view of the Reichsführer SS than many. Um, but uh, it's indisputable that he tended to exploit people uh, to the for what they could for what he felt they could contribute to the institution of the SS. Um, and once that was fully realized, generally he didn't have much use for them anymore. I believe that's the way to understand uh, Vilgut um, and his relationship to the Schutzstaffel. Um, I realize there was like a lot there just now. Um, it uh, we can get into kind of, <coughs> and I didn't mean to like totally dominate the conversation, but we can. No, uh, that's 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 why I want you here because you you have the knowledge oh, yeah, about, yeah. about this stuff. Um, yeah, so I, I'm curious. I want to dig maybe a little bit more, and we'll save a little bit for the smoke filled room and get into some other areas. But I wanted to dig a little more into the the archeo archaeological aspect of things because <laughs> again, I think a lot of my view is probably just the Indiana Jones uh, version of it, the Steven Spielberg um, to gain this power from these devices. But what to what extent were, were Himmler and and the Nazis? actively participating in archaeological type stuff to actually find some of the stuff, whether it's the Spear of Destiny, like you mentioned, or the Ark of the Covenant. To what extent was that actually going on, and, and to what end? I mean, it was uh, the Tibet mission, uh, which was actually, uh, there's, there's a film with Brad Pitt uh, like about that expedition, which is, it's, we, we, it was strange they made that film, because like it's not, um, you know, it's, it's peculiar they'd, uh, and it was like an American movie house that, or, or studio that 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 produced it. But it uh, again, seven a lot years of into that, is, that's, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. of the stuff. I mean, that the primary, um, a, a lot of this, a lot of this was uh, you know, kind of like the basic, uh, it, just kind of like in the basic in, interest of anthropology itself, as mm -hmm. was going on in all developed countries in the world, you know. But before uh, before the capability existed to you know map human genetics, uh, like quite literally studying uh, insular remote populations, taking note of their racial quite literally their morphological and racial characteristics, you know taking note of their linguistic heritage, and you know by kind of painstaking process of comparative analysis, you know saying like where did these people come from, what are their origins, you know I mean things like that. Um, Part something that if if you look at the Third Reich as you know Hitler's enterprise being you know Hitler the artist wanted to mold Europe into something aesthetically uh, and historically splendid, as well as guaranteeing its literal like racial survival and posterity amidst kind of like the long spiritual and existential crisis of Europe um, that entails certain uh, that, that, it, that that entails certain uh, priorities. Okay, one of which was making Germany quite literally like, you know, Europa, Germania, Europa. One of which was making it kind of like the, like, you know, kind of a hub of the civilized world. You know, Despite what people say about, like, oh, the Nazis were looting artwork. Well, America was bombing Europe into the Stone Age and annihilating it. Okay? So, taking artwork and precious things that can't, you know, that, that, are, that are, you know, that are irreplaceable if destroyed and housing them in safe places, you know, was one thing that, you know, Berlin decided was imperative. But even before uh, the onset of the War of Annihilation against Europe, there's an understanding that, you know, Germania is going to be the capital of the world, quite literally. I mean, a civilized world, at least. You know, we're going to be we're going to want to be able to showcase artifacts, you know, kind of telling like the story of our uh, not just our race's primordial origins, but, you know, being able to show people, you know, these like. You know, these these archaeological these archaeological marvels mined from far and wide on this planet. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and searching for the Ark of the Covenant, which supposedly the Ethiopians have. I mean, I have no, <laughs> I have no idea how much people can take from that what they will. Uh, I've heard a lot of weird stories about that too. I yeah, mean, there's stories of um, that. There's stories of that one being guarded and and the people guarding it having like radiation poisoning and all this weird stuff. But that's a whole nother. That's a whole nother. Yeah, term. yeah. But it's but I mean the uh, there's 
archaeologists trying to find the Ark of the Covenant, that's not weird. And, the, right. and you know, right. whether you're talking about Englishmen or Americans or Frenchmen or Germans, and they start the word, I mean, finding the Ark of the Covenant would be incredible. Not because, like, oh, ghosts will come out of it and smite our enemies. It's because, right. I mean, because, because like, if it exists, it's an amazing freaking artifact, okay? Yeah, I mean, right. this is, uh, this is pretty clear. And it, um, but most of, uh, most of the most of these expeditions had a more prosaic. I mean, I think this stuff's fascinating, but it's it was mostly like there's pictures of um what Lenny Reifenstahl's even uh in tow on one of them, like you know because she's taking the photographs. You know, it's like it's her and her assistant. You know, with some like little kid in uh in some uh on the you know like toward like a um it's not in Romania, but it's it might it might have been Bulgaria. You know, like out and out in the out in the country, you know, and there there's like some like little gypsy kid or like Roma, if you want to be politically correct, you know, and they're like you know kind of documenting the kid's eye color and like you know their features and stuff, you know, like it's you know basically the kind of stuff that uh you know any any American university would have been doing too. I mean, mm -hmm. at the same time, approximately, it's um the uh and that's one of the things I've I've, I've wondered myself, like I uh, um. I'm a, I'm a, I, I've always thought it weird that like people like view like Germany as being like exotic somehow. I mean, like America is like, so like, it's like 40% of like the white people in America are like literally like German and like, uh, you know, in whole or in part, like myself included. I'm like overwhelmingly like Anglo and uh, like also Scott, but like I, my, I like my, my mom was like, yeah, hey, German. Okay. Um, it, uh, you know, it's like how, you know, we're not, we're not talking about, we're not talking about Arabs or Chinese or even like Russians. It's like, it's like, well, I don't know. It, it seems peculiar to me that people can cast like, like, like middle American, like white people can like cast the Germans. as kind of like this, like exotic kind of like strange race with like strange ways and beliefs. You know, it's like, it's like, they're like, just like you. They look the same people. as you. We just maybe yeah, yeah, they yeah, say yeah, things yeah. a little funnier yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was at, uh, yeah. No, so I read, no, I was just gonna say I really, I really appreciate the the overview here because there's a lot here. I think a lot of this too is what's interesting to me is it's like you were saying it's kind of like if if any other country or any other government that we look at historically without so much uh, venomous fervor were doing some of these things there wouldn't be a whole hoopla about it. Be like oh yeah they're just doing archaeological stuff. They're they're looking for what any archaeologist would want to find. Um, there's not necessarily like you said this uh you know this deep villainous sort of aspect to it that gets transplanted on it after the fact when we get sort of like you said the steven spielberg version of things well it's also there's something and i want to i want to take a break in just a minute because i gotta stretch yeah, my well, legs yeah finish what you're saying this. we'll wind down then we'll save the rest for the bonus show yeah yeah no i um you know and i'm sure this puts some people off they don't care but it's like you know the reason why like, i collect like all kinds of na nazi stuff and like i wear a lot of nazi stuff it's just like cool and sometimes there's not any reason for things other than that it's cool. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, why are you having a torchlight parade? Because it's fucking cool. You know, like why, 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 why are you building a big statue of uh, of Odin? Because it's fucking cool. You know, like why, like why, why, like why, 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 why you, you know, why are you study kind of like the primordial origin, like Bronze Age origins of uh, of Aryan man? Because it's right. fucking cool. You know, because it's like it's more exciting than you know, I like counting beans. That's why. Right. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's, it sounds like I'm being crudely facetious but some things are that simple yeah no i mean that's that's half of this show is i i dive into certain areas maybe there's deeper reasons for some of it but a lot of it is just like oh i think this thing's pretty cool to talk about yeah but let's check yeah. it out we don't have to think about it that that much more deeply uh tom it's been it's been awesome talking to you we're going to save a little bit more of this conversation for the smoke filled room bonus segment we'll come back in just a minute for that uh but uh before we wind down i know you're on Substack. you got some youtube stuff just feel free to let everybody know what the easiest way to find all your work is I mean, the one-stop kind of shop for to find my content is my website. It's thomas777.com, number 7, H-O-M-A-S, 777.com. You can find me on Substack. You know, that's where the pod is. And that that basically, like, keep up with me, like, uh, like what we're doing. When I say we, like, the people I associate with, we do a lot of stuff, like, in real space. You know, uh, we're I, I think of it as cadre building, but we do, like, fun stuff. So that's always posted up there. Um, like we're, we're going to do a cemetery walk at, uh, like Graceland cemetery here in Chi town, like for Halloween and, you know, stuff like that. Um, but that, the main thing is that's where the podcast is too. And that's where you can find like other, like semi long form content of mine. It's, um, Thomas seven, 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 
Uh, it's realthomas777.substack.com. You can find me on X, formerly Twitter, uh, real, capital R-E-A-L, underscore, number seven, H-O-M-A-S, seven, seven, seven. Um, I'm on, I'm on T-Gram, it's Thomas Graham, seek and ye shall find. Um, you know, like I, uh, but yeah, like I said, basically, uh, hit me up on Substack and hit me up on my website and, uh, you know, you can find what I'm up to. And the channel, the YouTube channel is Thomas TV. Number seven, H O M A S uh, TV, and uh, it's not populated by much now. But in, in the next few weeks, that'll change. So be like looking out for that. All right, Thomas, thank you so much. We'll dive a little bit deeper into some of the stuff in the smoke filled room in just a minute. But thanks so much for coming on my show. Thank you, man. All right, friends, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Thomas777, a man who has become somewhat of a legend in his own right uh, on the internet over the years in certain little circles and has sort of seen a bit of a revitalization due to his very, very extensive series of podcasts he's done with friend of the show, Pete Quinones. I can't recommend highly enough just heading over to the Pete Quinones show feed, free plug Pete, typing in Thomas777 and just starting from the beginning because they have done, if you're interested in this sort of thing, if you're interested uh, in history, World War II, and Thomas's uh, unique perspective on this kind of thing. So check that out. And this conversation continued in the smoke-filled room. Man, I wish I knew. I wish I knew how wild it was going to get because we just started scratching the surface and getting a little wild and crazy. We talked about UFOs. We talked about Skinwalker Ranch. We talked about metaphysical, spiritual experiences, visions, all sorts of weird and wild stuff. I had an awesome time in the smoke-filled room with Thomas777. You can get that by becoming a Mark Claire Show premium subscriber. So many ways to do this. I forgot to mention, I now have this set up on YouTube as well. You can become a members-only subscriber on YouTube. There should be buttons to click. Uh, I'll do my best to keep up with the bonus shows and everything also going on YouTube as well. Now that I got that running, I'm still working on Apple Podcasts. I'm running into walls there, but I should be able to sort that out eventually. I'm trying to give you every way imaginable to support the show. You can also head over to markclair.com, M-A-R-C-C-L-A-I-R.com. That's where I have every link for everything you need, ways to support the show, Patreon, Rockfin, Subscribestar. They're all wonderful. They're all great. I appreciate your efforts, no matter how you support the show or if you just listen to this free version like a lame uh, but hopefully you share it with friends and family and do your own part to share this thing because I'm a one man. Well, I shouldn't say that. I do have my great editor, Bobby, who helps out. Thank you. Thanks to you guys. Thanks to my supporters who allow me to hire an editor. That's a huge help off me. But other than that, I am a one man operation so I can use all the promotion, all the marketing, all the support I can get from the ground up. So if you are fans of the show, if you want to contribute in some small way, just tell a friend about the show. Send him an email. Say, hey, I checked out this cool podcast the other day. You might want to listen to it. It might scare you away. But anyway, check it out. Uh, whatever you can do is you can also leave me a five-star rating and a great review on Apple Podcasts. That is still the number one way to very easily and freely and cheaply in no more than a minute's time uh, help this show out, help boost us in that algorithm, uh, algorithm. So I really do appreciate all your help. My friends, we are rocking and rolling. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. Until next time, in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night.